Having a right mindset is one of the key aspects to earning money in the stock market. So before I would just buy stocks because I heard it was good and then I would earn some, lose a lot and I had no idea why I was losing money and I had no idea what I was doing. So then I decided to actually study investing and one person I studied was Peter Lynch and he's a top value investor. That made me realize that I was doing a lot of things wrong and helped me get on the right path. So if you're in the same boat, this video will help you as well. I put together 39 value investing principles that I found in his interviews and I put the timestamps in the description box below so it's easier for you to refer back to. You have your own style of investing so just use the concepts that you feel like you connect with. For example, I don't use every single rule that he follows by. Subscribe to learn more about investing and how money works. And for a quick guide on how to invest in the stock market, check out the link in the description box below. I frankly think it's a, a tragedy in America that the small investor has been convinced by the media, the print media, the, the radio, the television media, that they don't have a chance if they don't, the big institutions with all their computers and all their degrees and all their money have all the edges, and it just isn't true at all. And when they're convinced, when this happens, when this occurs, people act accordingly. They, when they believe it, they buy stocks for a week and they buy options and they buy the Chile fund this week and next week it's the Argentina fund and, and they get results proportioned to that kind of investing. And that's very bothersome. I think the public can do extremely well in the stock market on their own. I think the fact that institutions dominate the market today is a positive for small investors. These institutions push stocks on usual lows, they push them on usual highs. For someone that can sit back and have their own opinion, know something about industry, this is a positive. Start a paper portfolio. Say, I'm going to buy these 10 companies. And then write down in like five bullets why. What's the reason I bought those? And then keep checking a year later, what happened? Did, did they really keep growing or did a competitor come along? Do a paper portfolio, and you can do exactly what I did with a real portfolio and find out what am I good at, what am I bad at, am I really good at turnarounds, am I good at small growth companies, maybe I pay too high for stocks. You can do this very, you can do this over four or five years and learn what's your skills, and then specialize in that. I had owned thousands of companies, you know, the average person, all you need is a few in your lifetime yeah. to make a difference. I'm not saying anybody should buy a stock. I'm just saying if you buy, a, if you purchase a stock, you ought to do certain things. If you purchase the stock and do certain things, you will do better. If you're not ready to do those things, you, you should keep your money in the bank. Keep your money in a money market fund. Some people aren't willing to do the homework. They don't have the stomach for it. They should stay out. They're not doing Betty any good by taking half their life savings and putting in the stock market. Or they, they've, they've been lucky enough to save $50,000 or $60,000 to send their kids to college, and one's going to start in a year, and they're going to take all that money and put it on an equity mutual fund with a one-year horizon. That's doing no one any good. People have to understand we've had nine recessions since World War II. We'll have other recessions. But we're not in one now. But we may goodness. have one in the future, and don't get worried about it. It will have one. Sometime it will happen, and no one will tell you when it's going to happen. It's just, well, but won't the fundamentals tell you? No, you'll find out after the fact. You'll, all of a sudden, you'll notice orders slowing, prices get more competitive, then earnings are down. I mean, usually you find out after the fact. No one declares. Everybody's been saying we're going to have a recession for five years. It just hasn't happened. I think it's very important that people understand when they own a bond fund, that bonds can go up and down. Bonds are just about as volatile as stocks. And if they own a 30-year bond fund, that you can lose 25, 30% of your money very fast, even though they're government bonds. Uh, people have to understand this. The single, uh, single most important thing to me in the stock market for anyone is to know what you own. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. They, they would not be able to tell you why they own it. They couldn't say in a minute or less why they own it. Actually, if you really press them down, they'd say, the reason I own this is the sucker's going up. I mean, that's the only reason. <laughs> that's the only reason they own it. And if you can't explain, I'm serious, you can't explain to a 10-year-old in two minutes or less why you own a stock, you shouldn't own it. This is the kind of company people adore owning. This is a relatively simple company. They make a, a very uh, narrow, easy to understand product. They make a one megabit SRAM, CMOS, bipolar risk, floating point, data IO, IO array processor with an optimizing compiler, a 16 dual port memory, a double diffused metal oxide semiconductor monolithic logic chip with a plasma matrix vacuum fluorescent display. It has a 16-bit dual memory. It has a Unix operating system, four whetstone megaflop polysilicone emitter, a high bandwidth, that's very important, six gigahertz, 
double metallization communication protocol, an asynchronous backward compatibility, peripheral bus architecture, four-wave interleaved memory, a token ring interchange backplane, and it does in 15 nanoseconds of capability. Now, if you own a piece of crap like that, <laughs> you will never make money. Never. I made money in Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I can understand it. I, uh, when there was recessions, I didn't have to worry about what was happening. I could go there, and people were still there. I didn't have to worry about low-priced Korean imports. I mean, I just didn't have, you know, I can understand it. And you laugh, I made 10 or 15 times my money in Dunkin' Donuts. Those are the kind of stocks I can understand. If you don't understand it, it doesn't work. This is the single biggest principle. The companies that are boring are wonderful for me. I've done well with companies like Dunkin' Donuts. Well, companies like that, they're very easy to understand. No one's going to invent a better donut somewhere at MIT. The, the, the key thing is when the, when the stock goes from 10 to 6, if you understand what they do and you know they're financially solvent, you're fine. If you don't understand it, you can call the psychic hotline. But if you don't, if you don't understand it, you're probably going to do the wrong thing. You know, if you understand exactly what they're doing, it's, it's gone from 10 to 6, you'll buy more. If you're confused to start with, you'll say, well, there must be something wrong there. And then you, you, you're out. And then yeah. A lot yeah. of times, stocks are going to decline. I mean, some of my best stocks have gone from 18 to 8, then to sometimes to 40. And some have gone from 18 to 0. <laughs> but at least I wasn't adding to it on the way to 0. A lot have gone to 0. So if it's yeah. going down, you're not adding to it? I mean, sometimes you are. If, if the fundamentals are getting better, they're the same. But, yeah. but if they're deteriorating, I'm going to leave. It bothers me that people are, are very dangerous when they invest. This word, play the market. That's a dangerous term. But if you do some work, do some research, know what you own, look at the, research, look at the balance sheet, you, if you could add eight and eight, get fairly close to 16, you find out this company has lots of debt, no cash, they're in trouble, you shouldn't own it. So a little bit of research. People are careful they buy a refrigerator, careful they take a vacation. And they, they'll put five, ten thousand dollars on some stock to hear on the bus or to party. That's dangerous. People will hear a tip on a bus on some stock and they'll put half their life savings in it before sunset and they wonder why they lose money in the stock market. That is garbage. They didn't do any research. They bought a piece of junk. They didn't look at the balance sheet and that's what you get for it. You have to have an itch. I mean, you, let's say the cement industry goes from crummy to semi-crummy to fairly good. <laughs> yeah. The stocks are going north. Right. You're going to make money. That's the industry you know. What if you know the publishing industry? You, you, some people have, you have an itch. You work. I mean, what if you last 30 years you worked in the restaurant industry. You would have seen Taco Bell. Right. You would have seen Sabaros. Right. You would have seen Pizza Hut. You would have seen Chili's. You would have seen these companies doing very well. You should have bought those instead of trying to buy biotechnology stocks exactly. you know nothing about. And they should have been buying that company instead of out buying something they don't know anything about, some oil drilling company. You only need a few stocks in your lifetime. They're in your industry. When your lifetime's over, you don't need a lot of five baggers to make a lot of money starting with $10,000 or $5,000. So in your own industry, you're going to see a lot of stocks. And that's what bothers me. There are good stocks out there looking for you, and people just aren't listening, and they're just not watching it. And uh, they have incredible edges. People have big edges over me. If you look at Magellan or you look at, at, right. uh, at BlackRock, you, you think they must have access to the best information in the world. But, but they, don't, they don't have that information. They're not in the steel industry. They don't see things get better, you know, the way, the way they, they don't see the chemical industry turning as soon as the people in the chemical industry do. I mean, you could be in the plastics fields or lithium, whatever it is. People in the business see it first. And that, they see it first. There is a method. There are reasons for stocks that go up. Uh, Coca-Cola, this is very magic. It's a very magic number. Easy to remember. Coca-Cola is earning 30 times per share what they did 32 years ago. The stock has gone up 30-fold. Bethlehem Steel is earning less than they did 30 years ago. The stock is half its price of 30 years ago. Stocks are not lottery tickets. There's a company behind every stock. If a company does well, the stock does well. It's not that complicated. You look for companies that have something unique. Like an example would be Toys R Us when I first found that. You know, they, they only were in, they only had seven or eight stores. You said to yourself, they could, this concept could have two or three hundred stores. You should be looking at the company when you get the quarterly reports. You should be, if you're at the mall, imagine if you were in the, re, if you're in the retailing industry or if you're in the restaurant industry, you would have seen Taco Bell, you would have seen McDonald's. You would have seen Toys R Us. I mean, you would have seen all these companies do terrifically well. You would have seen Bombay. You would have seen Tandy with Radio Shack. And you would have seen Radio Shack roll across the country. And pretty soon there were, you know, 25 Radio Shacks in every major city. And you said, there's not much room for them to go. But they had a 20-year great run. You, that's what you're dealing with. You're not dealing with 
the minutia of today. You're dealing, what's this company doing two years, three years, four years, five years from now? And if you're dealing with a cyclical and business is turning around, you wait for signs that business is slowing down. And when you see it, you move on to something else. Imagine if you were in a mall the last 50 years. You would have seen Gap when it was hot, you would have seen Limited when it was hot, you would have seen when it was not hot. You would have seen when they were starting, people weren't excited about Gap anymore. Or, or, and then you do some research and say, well, gee, there's a lot of limited stores, but we're only at 20. You know, they can go to 400. So you, you, you see a company, I did really well with Dunkin' Donuts, a local company. I did well with Stop and Shop. But people could see that this is really some people showing up, or I guess the Sunglass Hut, no one's there anymore. So I mean, that's research. That's fundamentals. So in, but you don't leave the mall, though, and buy that day. You, <laughs> you have to do some more work. If, if you're working hard, you're always checking with competitors, you're checking with right, customers, right. suppliers. Right. Right. You're trying to do work to find out, is this company still early? I mean, does, does they have years and years of growth ahead of them. Mm -hmm. Then you stay with it, no matter, even if the stock goes down. One thing you're trying to do is That's say, of people. all these public companies out there, here's the company I really like. The fundamentals are terrific. Their earnings are doing well. Their competitors are doing poorly. I think this company's doing terrific. And all of a sudden, the stock might have gone from 40 to 30 because of this decline. That would say, wow, here's a chance to buy it. So you're trying to say some companies might have been overpriced at 60, and all they did was go to 50 and say, big deal. So you're trying to find companies you liked anyway. Right now, you liked them. And now they've had a haircut. That's what you would do. You, not, not a stock that went from overpriced to fairly priced. Something that was fairly priced at the start of this exercise and then had a very, you know, a five for four sale. You know, which companies are the same story? Is there anything really happening? This is a non-event for them. They're still doing well. Even if we have a recession, there's nothing to do with them. And, and that's the kind of kinds I'm trying to buy. So you can say, this is a company I want to look at. And I want to see what are the cash looks like. And if you don't understand what cash is, if you don't understand what debt is, I always said, let's say you're looking at companies that are doing poorly. That they're not doing very well. Why don't you buy the one that has $300 million in cash instead of the one that's almost bankrupt? I mean, a lot of companies are selling at 2 or $3 a share. They might be losing $10 well, million. That's a dollars, brainer, isn't it? But people don't do it. For the research well, at least B. you can look up the balance sheet and say, listen, they got $300 million in cash. If they're losing $10 million a quarter. They'll be okay. Yeah. This other company's got no, no cash, $700 million in debt. They're yeah. about to blow taps. But, but you, and at three, I figured out, you know, there's something very wrong here because Kaiser Industries owns 40% of Kaiser Steel. They own 40% of Kaiser Aluminum. They own 32% of Kaiser Cement. They own Kaiser Broadcasting, they own Kaiser Santa Gravel, Kaiser Engineers, they own Jeep, they own business after business, and they had no debt. Now, I learned this very early. This might be a breakthrough for some people. It's very hard to go bankrupt if you don't have any debt. When do you sell stocks? When you sell a stock is exactly the reason you buy it. You write down the reason you bought it. I bought Subaru. Subaru was a distributor. They didn't, they didn't, make any, they didn't actually make the cars. I think it was Fuji Heavy Industries made the cars. They distributed uh, Subarus in the United States. The stock was, uh, I think the stock was 80. It was up from 6 to 80. I was a little late on this, but it didn't bother me, and I should never let that bother you. I didn't let it bother me. They had $40 a share in cash. They had a very low-priced car. It was well-liked. And it did well for about five or six years, and I think the stock went from 80 to 320. The reason I sold Subaru, thank you. The reason I sold Subaru is Hyundai came in with a low-cost car. Chrysler cut the, cut the price of Omni Horizon. Ford came out with a low price car at the end. All of a sudden, the Subaru was no longer unique. So if the car's not a buy, the stock's not a buy. That's what you're looking for. The reason you buy a stock, you keep it posted. If the reason changes, you go on to something else. At what point do you decide in a company to cut your losses? It's only if the company's doing poorly. If, if you bought a company because you thought this new product was going to work, or the aluminum industry was turning around, and you know something about the aluminum industry, if all of a sudden the product isn't working, or the industry's getting worse. If you're wrong in the fundamentals, then you sell. If the company's doing fine and the stock goes down, that's a great opportunity. Well, you could have bought Walmart 10 years after it went public, then it went up 50-fold. It's already up 10-fold. That's 500-fold. Yeah. 10 years after they're public, they're only in 18% of the United States. They went to 19, 20. So you can say to yourself, there's a lot of room to go. But when you're in every state, when Limited got to every single mall in the United States, yeah. with Express and Limited, you say to yourself, they're in the 8th or 9th inning. Where can they go? Yeah. So that's how you define it. With a cyclical, when uh, it goes from crummy to semi-crummy, you're happy. Yeah. Then when it goes to good, you're happy. Then it goes to very good, you say, maybe I ought to yeah. go on to something else. When I rebound to 10, I'll sell. Uh, here's a great rule. Uh, somebody buys a stock at 10, and it falls to 6. They say, well, if it gets back to 10, I'll sell. Now, I think the math, 4 and 6, I can handle this level of math. I think that's about a 66% return. You ought to buy it. If you think it's going back to 10, you ought to buy the hell out of the damn thing. But they think if it gets back to 10, I'll sell. 
Now, what you ought to do is never put down a round number, because I think for the next 26 years, this stock will be between five and nine and a quarter. It'll never get to 10. <laughs> so maybe put nine and eighth or eight and three quarters. But just saying the stock, if it gets back to what I paid for it, this is a very important rule. This is, a very, this is one of the key rules. The stock doesn't know you own it. <laughs> Remember that. You could be a miserable person. You could have, uh, you know, never helped anybody, never done anything right, had 67 spouses, never done anything right. If you own Coca-Cola the last 50 years, it's gone up 300-fold. You could be the greatest human in the world, help Special Olympics, help the mentally challenged, help poor people, help AIDS people. If you own Bethlehem Steel, it's lower than it was 30 years ago. It's not your fault. Don't take this personal, you know. <laughs> but people treat stocks sometimes like they're grandchildren or a puppy. I mean, they, they, they think, they think the stock knows who you are. You know, it's, you know, it doesn't work that way. It, uh... Remember this one, it's futile to predict the economy, interest rates, and stock market. I mean, people keep trying to do this. I mean, this would be useful. I would love to know when we're going to have a recession. I'd love to know when interest rates are going to go up or down. I'd love to know when the stock market's going up. That would be helpful. I would like to get next year's Wall Street Journal. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get it. And uh, all you need to know about the stock market is it goes up and it goes down, and it goes down a lot. And that's all you need to know. Again, it'd be terrific to know what's going to happen to the economy, but I deal with facts. If inventories are going up, if copper prices are going down, if room occupancy is going the wrong way, if people are building too many hotels, I look at freight car loadings when I own railroad stocks. I deal with facts. I don't deal with people tell me something's going to happen in the future. So I have no idea when the market's going to go down. and. Uh, no idea when it's going to go up. I'm totally shocked the market was 4,000 two and a half years ago. A little while ago, it's 8,000. Uh, I had no idea about this. Uh, very surprising to me. But I'll guarantee you the market will be a lot higher in 15 years. It'll be a lot higher in 25 years. What it's going to do in the next one or two years, I don't have any idea. This we could about. take a coin out and flip it. I have no idea what the next 1,000 points is going to do. The next 6,000 points is going to be up. The next 14,000 points can be up. The next 20,000 points can be up. But you don't know where the next 1,000 is going to be. It Nobody could be does. down, could be up, could Nobody be... Nobody does. And, and it's futile to try and guess it. Corporate profits will be a lot higher 10 years from now. They'll be a lot higher 20 years from now. That's what you could rely on. Microsoft didn't exist 20 years ago. Staples didn't exist 20 years ago. Federal Express didn't exist 20 years ago. New companies will come along. History is the important thing you learn from. What you learn from history is the market goes down. It goes down a lot. The math is simple. There's been 93 years a century. This is easy to do. The market's had 50 declines of 10% or more. So 50 declines in 93 years. About once every two years, the market falls 10%. Of those 50 declines, 15 have been 25% or more. That's known as a bear market. We've had 15 declines in 93 years. So every six years, the market's going to have a 25% decline. That's all you need to know. You need to know the market's going to go down sometime. If you're not ready for that, you shouldn't own stocks. And it's good when it happens. If you like a stock at 14 and it goes to 6, that's great. You understand the company, you look at the balance sheet, and they're doing fine. And you're hoping to get to 22 with it. 14 to 22 is terrific. 6 to 22 is exceptional. So you take advantage of these declines. They're going to happen. No one knows when they're going to happen. It would be very, people tell you about it after the fact that they predicted it, but they predicted it 53 times. And uh, so you can take advantage of the volatility in the market if you understand what you own. Well, obviously, the market's, market's gone up tenfold since I stopped running Magellan. So you make more money on the upside. The market's going to be a lot higher 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. The, the hedge funds, funds that have been on the long side have done the best. I mean, they, they may have a little bit by being short, but be, being right on the long side, because obviously, if you're right, you can make, and that's, I would say, when I ran Magellan, I might have been right six times out of ten. But if I'm right, I make a double or triple occasionally. It offsets the times you lose 30 or 40 percent. In fact, yeah. you could be right a third of the time as long as you have a lot of good re results. So that's, when you're short, you can only make 90 percent. When you're long, you can make tenfold or fivefold. So I think long is the way to be. You have to say to yourself, is five years from now, ten years from now, corporate profits have grown about seven or eight percent a year. That means they double. But mm -hmm. including dividends, but every 10 years, quadruple every 20, go up eightfold every 40. Yeah. I, mean, you know, it's a, I think that's the kind of numbers you're interested in. A 10-year bond today is a little over 2%. Mm -hmm. So I think the stock market's the best place to be for the next 10, 20, 30 years. The next two years, 
no idea. I've never known what the next two years are going to bring. But volatility will occur, and markets will continue to have these ups and downs. I think that's a great opportunity if people can understand what they own. If they don't understand what they own, they can own mutual funds, try and figure out mutual funds they own, and keep adding to it. Over Basically, corporate profits have grown about 8% a year, historically. So corporate profits double about every nine years. The stock market ought to double about every nine years. So I think the next market's about 3,800 today, 3,700. I'm pretty convinced the next 3,800 points will be up. It won't be down. The next 500 points, the next 600 points, I don't know which way they're going. So the market ought to double in the next eight or nine years. It ought to double again in the eight or nine years after that. Because profits will go up 8% a year and, and stocks will fall. That's all there is to it. My best stocks have been my fifth, sixth, seventh year I own them. Not my fifth, sixth, seventh day. So you have to understand that and uh, stay with it. And then, uh, this is important whether you're investing for a four-year-old, a 14-year-old, or a 74-year-old. You have to say, what am I going to do when the market goes down? Because I've had audiences like this, larger audiences, and I'll say, how many people in the room are short-term investors? I've never had anybody ever raise their hand. I mean, everybody in the world is a long-term investor until the market goes down, and like in 90, I remember 1990. 1990 was so much scarier than 87. 87, the market just fell down. And you call up companies and say, our business is terrific. We're about to announce a stock buyback. We're already buying back our stock. Business is great, and we can't figure this out. But in 1990, you had Kuwait invaded. You had uh, the banking system really on the ropes. I mean, really close. You call up a company and said the business was slowing down. We sent 500,000 troops to Saudi. And uh, we were about to fight what people thought was the, uh, remember this, was the, it was the fourth largest army in the world, and they were the toughest army in the world, and we were, this was going to be a terrible war. But that was an ugly time, and uh, that was very scary. And the public stood, a lot, some people learned from 87, and they stood throughout that and said, I'm confident about the next 5, 10, 15 years of this country, and they hung in there. So I would say if you want to buy a small growth fund, or you want to buy a balanced fund that's part bonds and part stocks, you put so much money in, put more in every year, you'll be very pleased in 10, 20, 30 years. Stocks will beat the hell out of money markets. They can beat the hell out of bonds. No group of, you think of it, any corporations, McDonald's, any of these great companies, Marriott, you name it, they've never got together and said, geez, you know, we're really doing well. Why don't we raise the coupon in our bonds? So, you know, those bondholders have been really loyal. No, no. <laughs> We, you know, we've been given 8%. Why don't we raise it to 9 you know. Uh, but companies like Automatic Data Processing, they do payrolls. an amazing prosaic company. 32 years of higher earnings. 32 years of double-digit earnings growth. We've had recessions. We've had wars. We've had changes in Congress, changes in the Supreme Court. 32 years about earnings. So, I mean, that's what you're relying on. Johnson Johnson, 30 years of earnings. I mean, these are general parts, 42 years of earnings. Emerson Electric, 38 years of earnings. You don't see companies like this other parts of the world. The way you beat the index is you, you avoid the stocks to go down. You avoid the steel companies and the oil companies and Sears and Penny and the, where the companies are deteriorated. I mean, companies are dynamic. The, the, behind every stock, there's a company. These are not lottery tickets. So we, you're trying to find the companies within the S&P 500 that are doing better. They're going from crappy to semi-crappy to good. That might take a couple years, or they're going to grow for a long time. And you're trying to avoid the companies that are going south. That's how you beat them. Or you find some companies outside the S&P 500 that are, that are great companies. CarMax was not in the S&P 500. They went up 200-fold. So a lot of companies that enter, and a lot of their great performances before they go in. If you put $1,000 in a stock, all you can lose is 1000 I've done that several times. And, uh, but if you're right, you can make 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. So this business, you don't have to be right one out of two times. You can be right one out of four. It's a long time. The times you're right, you know the company's doing well, you know they're doing a great job, and you add to it, or at least you don't sell it, which is a terrible tragedy. So you can make more money on the upside. So I just, I just wrote those out, and I'll now flip a coin to tell you where the market will go to 4,000, this year or next year. Uh, heads means it goes up, it's a two-headed coin. Uh, <laughs> The market will go up in the next year. That's, it. That's all I ever know about the stock market. But let's say if a company, just think of it, this as being, you say to yourself, I think this company's going to earn something in the future. If it's already discounting that, if it's selling at a huge multiple, you say, it's already, it has to work, and then it's only going to stay even. So you have to say to yourself, if I'm right, how much am I going to make? If 
I'm wrong, how much am I going to lose? That's the risk reward ratio. In stock shop, we talk about if I'm right, I hope I'm going to double trip my money. If I'm wrong, may I lose 30, 40%. That's a favorable ratio. We say if I'm right, the stock's not going to go up. It's already discounting terrific things. If discounting terrific things are already in the stock, I don't want to own okay. Avoid long shots. Uh, you know, these are the stocks that are going to uh, grow hair and uh, make your kid have better spelling and your breasts can improve and you won't have to iron your pants. I mean, it's one of those stocks and they always do everything for you. But they're missing, they don't have any sales yet. You know, that's the missing element to the story. The story is sensation. <laughs> There's no profits here, no sales yet, but my God, if this works, if this works, it's gonna be the next Xerox, you know, and, uh, and it's gonna help Murr and Space and everything. You know, it's a very, very good deal. Now, this is not a long shot, this is a no shot. You have to separate these out. I've tried 30 of these. I have never broken even on a long shot, never. I've made 25, 30 times my money on some stocks. I never thought about Sally Mae or MBIA or Fannie Mae or some of the banks or Stop and Shop. I'd make 20 times my money, 30 times my money. I had no idea. I thought the stocks were going north. I had no idea. You look back 10 years later, you say, my God, I made a lot of money in this thing. The ones I went into thinking I could make four times my money, I've never broken even. So don't do the long shot, guys. They don't work. And again, if a stock's three, and it has huge potential, write down the story, take the stock symbol. If it's going to 300, it's okay to buy it at 15. Check in later, check in a year later. See if it's still listed, see if you still get a quote on it. See if they still have the earnings yet. <laughs> but if it's going, write the story down. Some of these work, I haven't heard yet, but maybe they will work. But it's worth tuning in six months later. Don't buy it then. They said you have plenty of time. People are in an unbelievable rush to buy a stock. I'll give you an example of a well-known company. Walmart went public in October of 1970. 1970 went public. Already had a great record. It had 15 years performance, great balance sheet. You could have waited 10 years saying you're a very conservative investor. You're not sure this Walmart can make it. You want to check. You're, you're, you see them operate in small towns. You're afraid they can only make it in seven or eight states. You want to wait till they go to more states. You keep waiting. You could have bought Walmart 10 years after it went public. I made 35 times your money. If you bought it when they went public, you would have made 500 times your money. But you could have waited 10 years after Walmart went public and made uh, 30, over 30 times your money. You could wait three years after Microsoft went public and made 10 times your money. I mean, there's always something to worry about. In the 50s, it was depression and nuclear war. The 50s was the best decade this century for the stock market, except for the 80s. Only slightly better. These are only slightly better. People didn't expect a lot. We had an okay, it wasn't a great uh, decade. They just didn't expect much. We made it through. And the uh, stock market was terrific. So there's always something to worry about. And the key organ in your body in the stock market is your stomach. It's not the brain. All you have to know is you're going to see it. It's always going to be scary. There's going to be always something to worry about. And you just have to forget all about it. Cut it all out and own good companies, our own turnarounds, study them and you'll do well. If you put $20,000 in a stock at 50, or your neighbor put $20,000 at full at 50 into the stock, and you put $20,000 in at three, and it goes to zero, you lose exactly the same amount of money, everything. <laughs> and people say it's three, how much can I lose? Well, if you put a million dollars on it, you can lose a million dollars. There's a great expression in the textile industry. It's always darkest before pitch black. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now that's a good one to remember, because when business is terrible, it can get considerably terrible, it can get terrible to the power of six. So just because business is getting bad, that's not a reason to invest. Wait for things to get better. Because again, somebody might be involved in the ceiling, they might be involved in coal, they might be involved in iron ore, they might be involved in plastics. They'll see it aluminum pick up before I do. So you might, that's a cyclical turnaround. That might last two or three years. You might see it way before Wall Street sees it. So you can't just say you can't go any lower, because I saw Taco Bell go from 14 to 1 in 1974, and they had no debt and making 60 cents a share. Just the fact that stock, this is the only, this may be a reason to research a stock, the fact that stock is three down from 100 doesn't mean you should uh, buy it. And in fact, short sellers, people that really make money in stocks, they don't short Walmart, they don't short Home Depot, they don't short the great companies, Johnson Johnson, they short stocks down from 80 to 7. They'd like to short it at 16 or 22, but they, they figured out at 7 that this company is going to go to zero. 
They just haven't blown taps on this thing yet. It's going to zero. And they're, they're selling short at seven, they're selling short at six, at five, at four, at three, at two, at one and a quarter. And you know what, to sell something short, you need a buyer. Somebody has to buy the damn thing. And you wonder, who's buying this thing? It's these people saying, it's three, how much lower can it go? You know? If it's gone this high already, how can it possibly go lower? Uh, higher, sorry. That. Philip Morris, adjusted for splits, uh, sold for 12 cents in 1951. And then it goes to 60 cents in 1961. So it goes up fivefold, and you say to yourself, how much, this, it never sold for that, but just for splits, you say, how much higher can this go? It's gone up fivefold. They missed the power of Marlboro. They missed the, there's 220 countries in the world. They missed the cash flow of the company. They missed everything. This stock was a hundred bagger after going up fivefold. But people sold it just saying, how much higher can it go? Can't go any higher. They did the same at Home Depot. They did the same with Toys R Us. I did the same thing with Toys R Us. Just saying it can't go any higher, it's gone this much already, that's very dangerous, and don't, don't use that one. Eventually, they always come back. Uh, this, one is, uh, this one doesn't work either. Uh, people think uh, RCA just about got back to its 1929 high when General Electric took it over. Uh, a lot of double knits never came back. Remember those beauties? Uh, uh, floppy disks, Western Union. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, People saying it'll come back. Well, it doesn't have to come back. I don't have to worry. I own conservative stocks. I remember Con Ed fell uh, 80%, then tripled. Uh, Public Service Indiana went down 90%. Gulf States Utilities, Long on Lighting. This may be an oxymoron. We had quality Texas banks that went to zero. We had uh, <laughs> quality New England banks that went to zero. Uh, these were companies that have been around for 150 years, 120 years. Saying I own conservative stocks, I don't have to worry. Don't tell anybody you own a conservative stock. Companies are very dynamic. I don't buy that argument. Here's a very dangerous one. Look at all the money I've lost. I didn't buy it. I listed, uh, I think, about 200 stocks, A through L, on the New York Stock Exchange, that went up tenfold or more that I didn't own while I ran Magellan. I had owned lots of stocks. I listed 200 stocks, A through L. I stopped at letter L, and I didn't own any of these shares. They went up tenfold or more, and I was able to do okay with Magellan. And people worry all the time about missing Microsoft, missing Western Digital, missing uh, United Airlines. They spend all their time worrying about stocks they miss. You cannot lose money in a stock you don't own. That's a very important. You have, the only way to lose money is buy a stock, have it go down, and sell it. That's the only way. I missed that one. I'll catch the next one. That usually does not work. Toys R Us, there was a lot of copycats of Toys R Us. There was Trial World, there was Lionel, there was copycats of Home Depot. Buying the next of something usually doesn't work. It's, uh, it's very bad. It's like Stock has gone up, I must be right. Stock has gone down, I must be wrong. I am convinced that people do this all the time. They buy a stock at 10, they buy a little bit of it, it goes to 13, they now say they don't know anything more about it than they knew when they bought it at 10. They have no idea what this company does, but it's gone to 13 now, they take a second mortgage in the house and buy it at 13. The best thing that happened for us is to go directly from 10 to 4 for these folks. You know. It's going to go to 4 eventually, but it goes to 13 in the middle. They're convinced now they bought 100 shares at 10. Now they buy 20,000 at 13. And uh, all the fact is the stock went from 10 to 13 is it went up. The average movement of a stock in the New York Stock Exchange this century, between its high and its low, has been 50%. The average stock in the New York Stock Exchange. That means the stock started the year 20. Sometime during the year sold 16, sometime during the year sold at 24, might have finished the year 21, might have finished the year 19. The average range of a stock in the year stock exchange is 50% in 12 months, between its high and slow. So stocks go up and down a lot within a year. And to say this stock is going up means you're right, doesn't mean a damn thing. I love volatility. I, I think I remember when uh, in 1972 the market went from uh, uh, down dramatically, and Taco Bell went from 14 to 1. They had no debt, they never had a, a restaurant close, and uh, I started buying at 7, but I, I kept on to it, and it went to 1. And uh, it was the largest position in Magellan in 1978, when it was bought out for, by $42 by Pepsi-Cola, and I think it would have gone to 400 if they didn't buy it out. I think volatility is terrific. My big theory, and I think it's valid, if you look at 10 companies, you'll find one that's mispriced. 
You look at 20, you'll find two. You look at 100, you'll find 10. The person that turns over the most rocks wins the game. What I'd rather tell you is there are lots of great stocks out there, and you'll find them. Uh, be flexible. Uh, people have all these biases, all these prejudices. They want to buy high growth industries, they won't buy financial companies, they won't buy savings and loans, they won't buy uh, companies that start with the letter R. I mean, I, you know, there's all these rules, they all hurt you. There are great stocks everywhere. There are stocks that are near bankruptcy, stocks in bankruptcies, stocks about to go in bankruptcy. There are companies on the new high list that are attracted, there's companies on the new low list. They're all over the place. They're in growth industries, non-growth industries. Don't cut yourself off to one segment. People have way too many prejudices. Too many biases. Another thing about it is, is math and the kind of math we need to do this. I don't use a computer. I don't have a computer. Uh, I really was doing great math. I was, I remember 7 times 7 was 41 and 9 times 9 is 81 and, you know, 12 times 12, I think it was 144. So it was some big number. Anyway. I got that one down cold. I said, this is great, I love this stuff. And the barge left St. Louis going at eight miles an hour and the train left Pittsburgh and, ha, huh, this stuff is easy. I remember one day, I think it was ninth grade, it was a grim day, somebody introduced cosine. That day, I mean, remember cosine? I mean, is, has anybody used cosine the last couple of years? I mean, this, you know, the, uh, let's have a show of hands. How many of you have used cosine the last six months? But I, I remember tangent and cotangent. Why would you want to know about tangent? And then, remember the area under the curve? I mean, remember that crazy calculus area under the curve? I mean, what the hell would you want to measure an area under the curve for? You know, the, uh, I mean, that is such garbage. You know, you don't need this for the stock market. If you can measure, if you can add eight and eight and get fairly close to 16, <laughs> that's all you need. You know, you say 400 million in debt, no equity, no cash, losing money, forget it. You know, they get 300 million in cash, no debt, 200 million in net worth. They're losing 10 million a quarter, but they'll be around. That's all you need. You have to get, that's all you need. That does, is not that hard. If you made it through fifth grade math, you can handle this stuff. Well, we had a huge run. I mean, the market was 4,000 just, you know, two and a half years ago. Yeah. And it ran up to 8,300 in August. And, you know, like any big rally, sometimes it backs off. I mean, it's healthy. In fact, I mean, I'd rather have gone down 1,000 points than gone to 12,000. If you look at Japan, Japan went from 5,000 to 15,000 on their Dow. And it was fairly priced at 15,000 on earnings and everything else. Mm -hmm. Then it went to 40,000. And that caused seven years of inflated real estate, people overspending. And basically, they've been in a recession for five or six years because their market went up too high. I mean, if the market goes up too high, I mean, if, if the market goes too high, you're, you're discounting earnings seven, eight, ten years out. There's a so relationship. everything is overpriced. Yeah, and that doesn't help anything. The market since World War II has sold between 10 times earnings and 20 times earnings. If you look at the Dow Jones or the S&P 500, if you add up all the companies and take the earnings, you say there's a relationship, and it follows. McDonald's earnings have been terrific the last 30 years, and the stock's been terrific. There's a direct relationship. So the earnings of the S&P 500 have been between this range of 10 and 20. We were just about to go over the 20, which is the high end of the PE range. There wasn't a lot so of room left PE on the PE So the PE of 20 is, too, is, is at the it's top peak. of how high it should ever be. Right. It's been over there only a few times ever over 20, and that's yeah. when usually inflation's about zero. In the early 60s, when inflation was about zero, we got a little bit over 20. Now we have a very low inflation rate. So if you usually have subtracted inflation from 20, You've had the P of the market. That's been a pretty good ratio. When inflation was 12%, you remember in the early 80s, we had an 8 or 9 P of yeah. the market. Management is the single most important thing in a company. But for an outsider to know great management versus good management versus terrific management versus average management, tough to do. Tough to do. Because you only get an hour at people, sometimes a half an hour. And uh, how do you know what decisions they didn't make? A lot of great companies have been made because the company didn't make an acquisition. They didn't get rid of the division. They don't put in the end report, we didn't get rid of the tubing division. You know, you don't hear about that. Somebody said, made a brilliant decision, we're going to hold on to that thing, we're going to fix it, and it's doing great. Now, it might be doing great because some management eight years ago did it right, or some did something right five years ago. That person isn't there anymore. Or they didn't make any acquisitions. Or they expanded at the right time. So knowing what management what they can add to it. It's the single most important thing, very hard to measure. I've always said, I'd like to have a company any fool can uh, run, because eventually one will. And uh, <laughs> you really want to do that. When I bought Toys R Us, they had the formula right. Any four people in this room and me could have run Toys R Us. 
We wouldn't have done as well as they did. They're spectacular. But for the next 15 years, we had no competition. We had a great formula. We could have rolled with it. They probably would have done three times as good. They were the frosting on the cake. But they had the formula right, no competition. The department officers know what they're doing. There was no copycats. And they were going to just roll for the next 25 years. Same with Circuit City. So I want the story to be solid. If management can add anything on top of it, that's great. I want to buy the story. Assume management leaves the next day and they're replaced by the next generation. That's fine with me. If management can add something to it, that's great. I'm not going to buy it because people say they have great management. Because you'll notice great management is always attached to stocks been up the last eight years. You ever notice that? Because I looked at Reynolds Metals. I used to follow Reynolds Metals. The stock has had the same person run it for like 30 years. When, the, when the aluminum was tight, they'd say Reynolds Metals has great management. Aluminum going over supplies, these people are idiots. Then aluminum get tight, they say these people are terrific. I mean, it all to do with the price of aluminum. And they keep rating the management by how the stock's doing. It's very hard to measure management. It'd be wonderful to do. If you could spend months with them, really see them in action, then you'd know, but you don't really get that chance. 